So welcome Joanna Krisa, or Joe as we like to call you. And um, all the way from, where are we today? We are in Notting Hill in London. Of okay, all cool. Great. I just had to ask Joe because the last time I spoke to her, she was in Copenhagen. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm very proud Good to day. introduce Joanna Krisa. She's the founder and entrepreneur with consulting business, Krisa & Co. Um, this is an innovation, change, and diversity facilitation business. Uh, working with startups, Joe, as we call her, helps companies at various stages of their life cycle. From getting off the ground and working with established companies to working with them to stay and become competitive. In both cases, uh, change and diversity drive the innovation. So, yeah, would you like to, first of all, talk to us a little bit about what does your business do? Sure. Uh, so I founded my business on the back of some of the, uh, I'll come back to that, but of the uh, corporate problems that I experienced in my corporate career. So um, the business really tries to tackle the questions I think many businesses stand in front of, and especially now post the pandemic. So how do you create innovation and how do you change, how do you pivot your business model? So um, as you mentioned, I have worked from companies that are on the startup level. Uh, they are really trying to figure out what is our business model? How do we reach our customer? Maybe even who is our customer? Um, those fundamental first questions, but they're not very different when you talk about big corporates because big corporates oh. today, they have their why, uh, they might have their what, but sometimes the how needs to change. And that's where really uh, my consultancy and where we come in and we help companies, especially in the area of new innovation. So changing your business model, um, changing maybe reaching a new client group, things like that. Yeah, I, obviously working in a similar kind of space, I understand the, the moment you said business model, yeah, it's, it's not so much as like this is not working and you can't do it anymore, but rather for, I know it's an overused word, but pivoting. Yeah, exactly. Exactly, yeah. exactly that. So what was the, I mean, you've spoken a little bit about what you saw when you were in business, but what was the actual inspiration? What was your own personal inspiration? So um, my, my personal inspiration really came at the point, I worked for, 14 years uh, for, uh, there I mentioned it, but BMW Group. And in my last <laughs> job, I uh, was uh, heading a big project, a big strategic project, where we were really asked by the company to think outside the box. And um, we were allowed to really go crazy and think about what it could look like in the future. And so we did. Now, the project got halted in the end, uh, but what happened to me was personally, I really got the taste for this thinking uh, really, really creatively. Um, I realized that many big corporates, they have people with plenty of ideas, um, they want to change, they want to adapt to new circumstance, but they don't really have necessarily the time or they're not sure where to start or where to begin with this type of project. Um, simultaneously, I was getting in touch with um, startups in London that kept um, asking me for if I wanted to give them some advice on the side. And I realized there was an actual business opportunity here. So that was really what got me going and made me leave the corporate world for an entrepreneurial life. And I would really like to emphasize here that it's life. If you go for being an entrepreneur, don't think of it as, you know, you talk about the corporate world and the entrepreneurial life because it is a lifestyle change, right? Yeah. Uh, and Janine, you're, I mean, you're hugely experienced in this. Uh, really one of my role models, I have to say. So oh, because, awesome. yeah, but it's really, you know, you become the company and the company becomes you. Yeah. And I mean, this means vast amount of freedom, uh, but it also comes with re responsibility. Of course, you can be as creative as you want, but in the end of the day, you can't look at anybody else for delivery. It's on your shoulders, right? Yeah, yeah. But I loved the way you were talking about being creative. Um, I battle with that myself a little bit because you, you know, you're in that creative space so much and it's exciting. It's where, it's the cutting edge. It's where you can actually grow something. It's super exciting. Yeah, it is, it is. 
hugely. So um, who would you say is your dream client now? You've spoken about the automobile mm. industry. Um, I know that your work goes way beyond that. Yeah. So I have worked with companies, of course, within the automobile industry, but I'm really reaching far beyond because the questions that companies stand in front of are very, very similar. Um, they might be slightly tilted towards one or the other direction, depending on industry. Um, but most businesses now are looking at their business model. They're looking at um, new client groups. They are looking at maybe even creating a more sustainable business um, yeah. and bringing those values in. Um, and what I have learned over the years that for an innovation project to really succeed, um, the company needs to be willing to change and they also need to have the people in place to make it happen. Um, now I'm prepared to help both startups and corporates, but the premise I now set up uh, is really that the management of the company needs to stand behind it and really want the change because in otherwise it's not really going to happen. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I'd like to comment on that because I've dealt with corporate and, and, um, and I have seen that and I'd love your view on that. So there's a big drive at the moment for corporates to do internal, uh, yeah, <laughs> internal innovation. Yeah. Or, yeah. I mean, I, I yeah. love the idea that there's someone like yourself to come in and do that. Uh, and I think there's a real genuine solid place for that. Yeah, um, yeah, that's really interesting because I, I call it, it's something I don't know if I'm made up or, um, but I call it intrapreneurial uh, skills that they're looking for, right? Um, yeah. They're looking for people in their organization. And what I think is maybe the future um, is that companies create for a time, maybe three to six months think tanks, maybe for even up to a year, where they take in people like myself um, and basically that work as a little bit of an instigator and keep pushing for it. Um, because if you only have people from your own company, they will get distracted and there will yeah. be a little bit of corporate politics and there will be a little yeah. bit of this, a little bit of that. So it's really there where I see myself as a facilitator and keep moving the train forward. And it doesn't need to be forever in a company, right? Um, so you kind of, go off, you do the project, you say, this is what we need to change, keep doing it, and then you start the implementation. And the implementation is best done internally. I mean, it, it can't be somebody else um, implementing it for a company. That really needs to happen within the company with the structures and the processes and the people. Wow, that's interesting. Yeah, I haven't, met, I haven't uh, really seen any super uh, successful internal innovations. So I like the combination of getting the outside person to monitor the process, but then the actual implementation within happens internally. That, that's, yeah. that's fantastic, yeah. Um, okay, I love these questions we have in front of us. So, um, yeah. <laughs> how's this, how do you answer this? This is the problem I solve and the people I do it for. So, right. Um, so my, um, my, the problem I try to really solve is the challenge um, um, that I've mentioned that companies and startup space. So um, I also work with many entrepreneurs who are at the moment in the midst of one of the most important things. Uh, and I've also been there myself and I'm partly there myself of uh, fundraising. Ah. Um, and we look at how they can bring their product or service, uh, could be both, um, into a business model. And we go through what could the tar target audience be, but most importantly, how do they tell their story, right? And this is where I, it's hard to do for yourself, I've discovered, but it's much easier sometimes to come from the outside and really challenge somebody who's doing that journey. And it sounds really, really easy uh, until you have tried it yourself. Um, yeah. And then you realize how tricky that is. And I think that essentially that is tr absolutely transferable to a big company um, because yes, they have moved, they are further in their story. You know, they have answered some of their questions like their whys, um, but they need to move from something existing 
to something new. And that is even more painful sometimes to do the change, right? And this is again where I think that an external that comes in and kind of pushes that and questions it um, and asks those fundamental questions. Because like you mentioned, internally, it can be that you do a little tweak. You say, well, how about we do just a little bit more of this and a little bit less of that and we've solved the problem. Usually it's a bit more fundamental than that when you need to really change. Yeah, no, I agree. I, I could actually talk on that subject forever through my own experience. Yeah. <laughs> I know, I know. Yeah. Um, in terms of your own business, what would you say has been your biggest lesson? Um, well, it's been lessons that have cost me a lot of money. Yeah. <laughs> and I'll, say, I'll put my hand up and say, these are mistakes that I've made and that have cost me a lot of money and time uh, and energy. And that is that you need to be clear upfront with your clients. Uh, understand what exactly is it that they want you to do and what is it that they actually need. Because want and need is not always the same thing. So by understanding really what it is that they need, you can have a much better chance of uh, delivering on what they are asking you to do. Um, you also need to set the time frame. Um, and you also need to set one big thing, and that's how much time are they willing to put into that project. Um, because what you want to avoid, what I've ended up doing sometimes, that I, I work in a silo all of a sudden, and I have very little access to my clients. Um, and that makes work into a guessing game, um, but it also removes the ownership from, from the corporate or the people that were responsible for the project over to me. And that means that in the end of the day, they can refuse the project and say, it was her, it wasn't us. So it's really important with that ownership. So you, what I would say up front is split between want and need and also make sure that they dedicate enough resource on the project to make sure that um, they also own the project in the end of the day. I love that. Uh, put enough resources to it. Um, I think we actually mentioned in the in a circle uh, about you know get you know when you know we try and say to people you know the things that you're not good at or you don't have the time outsource it but if you're not if you've outsourced it in other words if they're using your services for a project but they're not doing a good brief to you really you're just going around in circles aren't you you are you are yeah. and in the end of the day um, you end up doing a project for your own fun almost and <laughs> they have yeah. no ownership they have no stake in it yeah um i think um what a woman who inspires you oh my gosh <laughs> there are uh so many amazing women out there uh that wow. inspire me and i really 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 want to talk about a few of them because i think that uh female role models are the most important that's where it really starts for a lot of female entrepreneurs and i would start to would like to make a big big nod to you and diane that have been taking us for uh through the um girl boss hustle and the inner circle it's been amazing and you have really really shown us so much inspiration and so much yeah, questioned us, challenged us. And I think that is really, really important to be in a safe place where people can be challenging you like that. Amazing. Oh, but um, I think if I'm going to pick a few, I'm going to say in the last months, I think there has been a really clear trend in the world. And that is that female politicians can handle a crisis better than men. I mean, look at Jacinda Ardern, <laughs> Meta Fredrickson in Denmark, Angela Merkel, um, they have shown that you can lead with strength, but still yeah. have compassion, right? Yeah. Um, and if I would mention an entrepreneur, um, I'm going to go with uh, Whitney Wolf. She's the founder of Bumble, the dating app Bumble. Um, yes, of course. I've listened to her podcast. Yes, that's yes. right. She went from being sexually harassed at Tinder as a co-founder, quitting. There was a little lawsuit as well, but okay. And she started up Bumble, which has been a huge success. And I mean, she's one of the few female entrepreneurs that have been portrayed pregnant on the cover of Forbes. So well done her. Wow. I would say that she really breaks the mold of, you know, you shouldn't get pregnant when you fundraise, you shouldn't be female, all of that. She's kind of proven that it's absolutely all possible. So women like that, 
I'm all up for it. And then I also want to go in here and say, I also hugely admire the courage of uh, Serena Williams and Simone Biles, incredible artists such as Beyonce or Taylor Swift. I think I, I read a quote somewhere of Beyonce, or no, sorry, of Serena, where she said that something in, in along the lines of the success of every woman should be to be an inspiration to other women. Wow. We should raise we should raise each other up uh, and make sure to be courageous, um, be strong, extremely kind, and ab above all, be humble. Yeah. And I think that is, um, I think that when women like her speak uh, like that, I think it's, it's inspirational. I mean, she's achieved quite a bit. She's also founded a VC, by the way. Yes, I saw that, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I've watched her closely, closely over the years. Um, and I love the way she owns her physical strength. Uh, that has been very powerful for me. Um, yeah. You know, I'm, I'm not a small, slack woman myself. <laughs> and <laughs> and when I see, no, I'm, I'm absolutely genuine. When I see someone like yeah. her, she owns her beauty and her power yeah. and her strength. And she's not a, and I think even when she stands up for women, she's not doing it in a, in an angry way. No. She does it in a, in a very um, empowering way. I just, I, I'm so glad you brought her up. Thank you. <laughs> oh, there's so many more, but I thought. Oh, I thought go, I, go for it. No, but I think it's, uh, it's, there is, um, it's always, uh, I think it's a shame when that question gets asked and you just mention one because the world, yeah is literally full of them. I mean, closest to my heart, of course, is my grandmother and my mother uh, who have been trailblazing in their own. I mean, my grandmother was uh, a doctor, one of the first educated in Estonia, fled during the Second World War and uh, ended up being uh, head of a hospital in Sweden. I mean, extremely strong story. And she has all sorts of wise words that she gave to me that I've shared in the, in the circle, but she, yeah. she was something different. Lovely, lovely. Yeah, I have to say those are my powerful ones, you know, and, you know, when the SH1 hits the fan, when the, you know, the shit hits the fan, you know, who do you, who the woman in your life you turn to? And it's normally, hopefully, your mom or your grandma. Yeah. Yeah. Right, right. It yeah. always is. Yeah. But, so my mom always uh, quotes Winston Churchill, don't let those bastards get you down. <laughs> I swear to God, I must hear that every single day from my mum. <laughs> That's actually a very good one. That's a very good one. Yeah. But, um, but I think we, could, we have to end now. But I think before we end, can you just tell me one quirky thing about yourself that you, you know is quirky, but you love it about yourself, that you're happy to share, of course? <laughs> yeah. Um, well, I... Um, one quirky thing about myself, uh, I think uh, that <laughs> that was a bit of a surprise question. And my my quirkiest <laughs> thing is probably uh, that uh, the the little dog I have. Many people don't think that about me, but I have a little uh, so called toy poodle, which <laughs> is a tiny little poodle that shadows me everywhere. And oh, people sick. don't know it, but she's always in my handbag, so she puts her little head up in the middle of business <laughs> meetings. Your little, your little uh, handmade teddy bear. <laughs> yes, and people, you know, you come, you look so corporate, and you try to be so strong, and then you have this little... <laughs> Beautiful, I love it. Bringing, bringing in the, the care and the kindness. Uh, that's yeah. beautiful. Well, thank you so much for this time. Sorry, yeah. Yeah, I, I think I've, I just want to kind of leave uh, one note to other female entrepreneurs is that you know, don't be too fear, uh, fearful of failure. More think about being hungry for success, right? Um, if you are in that mindset, you usually are creating. I am also uh, sometimes falling into the trap of fearing the failure, but keep your head up and be more hungry for the success. And it will go well. Beautiful, beautiful words to end with. Thank you very much. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Janine. Thank you.